everybody. Welcome to 140 Proof and Hack Deploy Scale. Thanks everybody for coming. Um, you are here for the Buzz Anderson talk, so hopefully you're all in the right place. Um, Hack Deploy Scale is a monthly series of free tech talks that we do. Uh, we have all different kinds of people come and share their technology story. Uh, last month we had Michelle Totolo, who is the CTO of Women Who Code. Uh, before that we had Sam Chalais, who is the head of engineering at Box.net. And we have a whole host of different people uh, lined up. So, uh, if you enjoy the talk tonight, definitely uh, sign up for, uh, for next month's as well. So I'm super excited for today's speaker for Buzz. Uh, he's someone that I've known for a long time. Uh, he's very central in, in the Mac community. And uh, he's got a very cool sort of career history in terms of Mac software. So anybody remember Podworks? Did anybody use Podworks? Got a couple, nice, nice. I was a Podworks user myself. So Podworks let you extract uh, music out of an iPod, which is something you weren't officially supposed to be doing. Uh, it's impressive because you know, he worked at, at Apple at the same time. Uh, he did an app called Cocolicious, uh, which was a delicious client, a basically native delicious client. Um, and you know, in the meantime, he was actually working at Apple, uh, working on things like Soundtrack Pro and OS X itself. So this is someone who really knows and can speak about, um, with, with a lot of depth, the, the world of Mac software. Um, he was the head of mobile development at Tumblr and helped them get their mobile strategy together and their mobile apps going. Uh, and he also did a little bit of development for a company called Square. So uh, the actual first iPhone app for Square is something that, uh, that Buzz was basically behind. And what everybody may not know is even though Square is a San Francisco-based company where the headquarters are, Buzz was sort of the one-man New York office. Uh, so the New York office was wherever he was standing. That was the New York team. <laughs> Um, and he's kind of long since fled the, the San Francisco Silicon Valley bubble. Uh, he's now uh, at home in Brooklyn doing something very cool called the Brooklyn Computer Club. I saw the shirt out there. Somebody had a, a BKC shirt. Um, and tonight his topic is going to be something that, uh, thanks, that's hopefully very relevant to everybody here um, who's kind of experiencing WWDC and lives in the world that we now do, which is very different. Uh, fully based on apps. And so there's an app called BirdFeed that there's some screenshots of uh, up here, which was a Twitter app. Uh, and it was a lot, very relevant to, to us at 140 Proof because we launched our business working with Twitter apps and Twitter app developers. And BirdFeed was one of those apps. So not only is he going to tell you, uh, you know, the good things about building that app, but he's also going to tell you about the apocalypse <laughs> of building this app. So uh, without uh, further ado, I'd love to welcome Buzz Anderson to tell the story. So yeah, all right, so my, uh, my talk, um, actually, so John asked me to talk about this. I, I was going to talk about something like really mundane, like core data or something like that. Um, and uh, he, he suggested this, and I was like, ah, well, I don't know, maybe it's a little, do we really want to dredge up history like that? But um, I do think there are, you know, there's some interesting things to talk about. Um, and uh, let's see, so what's my first slide? Who am I? I actually, I think John kind of covered that. I wasn't expecting that. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah, I worked at Apple Square. I've been doing like Mac or iOS development for a really long time. Um, the, uh, but the thing I'm here to talk about today is my app, BirdFeed, uh, oh, 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 uh, which, which was actually, which was actually, it was me and um, my friend Nevin, who some of you may know from the internet. He works for, for Panic in Portland, Oregon. And um, um, he, yeah, I think, uh, he's probably at the Gruber thing tonight. <laughs> um, but uh, that's, that's the icon for it. Um, let's see. But first, before I get into talking about uh, bird feed, I want to talk about something else that's very near and dear to my heart, which is, uh, a as we mentioned, uh, the movie Apocalypse Now and uh, the documentary about the making of the movie Apocalypse Now, Hearts of Darkness. Um, Hearts of Darkness is a movie I really suggest everybody who does anything creative should watch. Um, and it, it's basically about the, uh, the background um, of, of Apocalypse Now is that uh, Francis Coppola was part of uh, this group of USC students who were like uh, kind of changing the mold in the film industry. Like they wanted to do something uh, different. They wanted to get out of the old Hollywood mold. Uh, so. Coppola came up to San Francisco uh, and started a company, uh, I think I have a slide for this, yeah, called uh, American Zoetrope, and um, he made movies like The Conversation, uh, things that, uh, The Godfather, 
you know, some, some very good movies, actually. Um, but, you know, the problem for anybody who wants to do anything um, in this uh, sort of indie fashion is always money. It's, it's funding. And um, Coppola, I think, for a lot of his life has struggled quite a bit with, like, how to fund the sort of personal movies he wants to do. Like, he, he's a very personal movie maker. Um, he's very accustomed to operating in a, in a way... Like, you know, The Godfather, he'd get up and write a, uh, a page of the screenplay every day, and he'd be like, all right, this is what we're filming today. He's very used to operating this very personal. This is what I'm feeling now. This is where we're taking this movie. This is personal filmmaking. But it's hard to do that in a traditional sort of Hollywood, uh, you know, fashion. Um, so <clears throat> Coppola came up with the idea that he needed to do one big movie uh, that would kind of be the thing that would finance all of the other things he really wanted to do. And um, there's a, another great documentary that's on Netflix right now that I really suggest watching uh, is uh, Milius, about the, the screenwriter John Milius, who uh, is kind of an interesting guy. He, he directed Conan the Barbarian and Red Dawn and a bunch of things like that, a very kind of like right-wing militaristic filmmaker, uh, but a little bit out of step with his time, uh, which was the 60s. Um, but he uh, wrote the screenplay for Apocalypse Now, and for years, so uh, the inspiration for Apocalypse Now was the Joseph Conrad book, uh, um, Heart of Darkness, which is where the title of the documentary comes from. Um, and people had tried for years to adapt uh, Heart of Darkness as a movie. Um, uh, Orson Welles gave, a tr gave it a try, failed. A um, bunch of other people had tried. And John Milius had heard in one of his classes at USC that like people, so many people had failed to adapt Heart of Darkness. He was like, I'm going to do it. And he had the brilliant idea, I'm going to do it as a Vietnam movie. Um, and uh, it, the, the story of Heart of Darkness is, uh, well, actually, okay, I'm not going to get into that. But that's, that's probably a little, I'm like, all right, this is getting a little parabolic here. But uh, anyway, suffice to say, um, uh, the, the <laughs> specifics of this, because it was a Vietnam movie, it required uh, a lot that Coppola didn't, uh, when he was like, ah, oh, this will be my easy money-making thing. Uh, I got the screenplay, all I got to do is film it. Well, what he didn't take into account is he was going to be filming in, like, the Philippines in, like, tropical heat with monsoons and corrupt governments and, like, all kinds of crazy, like, huge effects shots. Like, he was used to being a guy who was like, I'm just going to write the, you know, next page of the screenplay today. Suddenly he's dealing with massive logistics, huge explosions, effects shots, helicopters, things like that. Um, and <clears throat> basically what the, the documentary tells the story of is that, um, well, long story short, he ended up like this, basically. Um, this is probably like one of the most famous uh, shots of, of Coppola from, from the era. Um, it, it, ve it very nearly drove him insane. In fact, uh, in, in, the, um, in the course of researching this, I discovered that not only is there Hearts of Darkness, there's actually even another short documentary somebody made about the editing of Apocalypse Now, which like took two years, which is a whole other subject in itself. So, and of course, like this whole time, Coppola is going bankrupt. Uh, he owned um, a bunch of film rights, things like the Black Stallion that he he had to sell, um, you know, to prevent himself from going into bankruptcy and to keep this huge sink that he'd gotten himself into, Apocalypse Now, going and and just being able to finish the damn thing. Um, and uh, so, uh, why do I bring that up? Well, because we're about to relive my own personal apocalypse now, uh, <laughs> which is a little dramatic, and I hope you'll indulge the comparison. But I really like uh, filmmaking. Um, I really like filmmaking analogies for software, um, partly because you know it's sexier than software. Um, but also partly because, you know, films are big creative projects that involve a lot of logistics and moving parts. They're complicated, they're expensive, they require a lot of money, um, and they're fundamentally creative, but they require a lot of collaboration and things like that. Um, so anyway, that, that's a shot of Martin Sheen from the movie representing me and the state I was in by the end of the project. Um, all right, so the first uh, thing, how I got into Twitter clients, um, Got you know, I'll establish some old school cred. I'm glad Mai is here, by the way, because Mai is actually the one who invited me to Twitter in back when it was like text message based. Um, yeah. Um, so th this is a shot of me um, in the old Odeo offices playing guitar. Um, I actually the first 
uh, sort of contact I ever had with uh, Twitter was um, I was at Apple at the time, I was working on Soundtrack Pro, and one of the things I worked on for Soundtrack Pro was podcasting. And uh, <laughs> so, you know, the, the classic podcasting Twitter connection, uh, you know, still exists here. Um, and I also was like the only one, um, I was like the only Mac developer most startup people in San Francisco at the time knew. That was sort of my like unique niche. So I, I talked to them, I came up and talked to them about working for them, but I was like, and I'm, this is not just like, I really actually was like, I don't think these people know what they're doing, and I don't think this is gonna work, and I'm not gonna leave Apple for this. Um, and, but they, and I was a little put off, like they seemed to really, really want me, but I was like, I don't understand like why you want me so bad. Like this Twitter client will probably take like six months, and then what am I gonna do? Or uh, sorry, the podcasting client, they wanted me to build the, <laughs> sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. They wanted me to build the native uh, podcasting sync component for Odeo. So uh, anyway, I didn't do that. Uh, and uh, years later, I was actually told, and this, I hope this doesn't sound like a brag, but uh, years later, I was told by Jack Dorsey himself, who I later worked for at Square, that they hired him for that job. That was the job they hired Jack for. Uh, so there's maybe an alternate universe where I decided to leave Apple and Twitter doesn't exist. And then <laughs> all, of this, all of this could have been averted. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so right, there's my first tweet. Mai there uh, invited me and my first uh, impression was like, it's like dodgeball but less because at the time dodgeball was very big in San Francisco and this was very text message based so I really didn't get it. Um, this is, this is a tweet from my wife that I <laughs> really liked uh, about um, I, was, I was strapped with apps while you were cuddling brats to, to paraphrase Apple executive Dr. Dre. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, you know, I go way back with Twitter now that I've established my, my bona fides there. Um, I also, my brother, uh, who is like I don't know, creative director or something of Square, um, and a, a, a great designer also supposedly, according to popular legend, is the guy who invented the at reply. Um, and this was very early on before Twitter had formal replies. Uh, what had happened here, he was replying, he was talking to me, and what had happened here was I had, I was at this place called Santana Row in San Jose, and I was at, I was like doing some clothing shopping and I was at a store that actually served alcohol on like Friday nights, which is I guess kind of a brilliant idea. Um, and I walked into a dressing room that had like big full length mirrors and I was a little bit drunk and just walked into a mirror <laughs> and like broke my thumb because I just like walked <laughs> straight into it. Uh, and so that occasioned the first at reply or so they say. Um, so you know, went way back. The other thing, um, and this is finally starting to get to the point here, um, my uh, my brother and this guy, Justin Williams, who's sort of a popular iOS industry curmudgeon now, um, developed a web-based Twitter client. This is back in the days of uh, what Steve Jobs popularly referred to as the sweet solution, which is basically, uh, oh, you wanna make apps for the iPhone? Web apps, that's the solution. Uh, that didn't last, of course, but for a while, one of the biggest, you know, most popular sort of categories of iOS web apps was, uh, uh, these sorts of Twitter clients. And uh, Twitter liked this thing, they featured it a lot, like, it, you know, it, it, and actually my brother um, got hired at Apple um, for the mobile me team, uh, which is another, that's another sort of apocalypse now type <laughs> story that somebody could tell. Um, he was actually in the room when uh, Steve Jobs yelled at everyone and everything, so. Um, but, uh, so he did this, and this had been around, and, um, Let's see, what's the next slide? Okay, so uh, some background for where I was at the time, and this will finally bring it back to the Apocalypse Now thing. I was a little bit like Coppola uh, in, you know, I like to fancy myself, um, in that uh, I, I viewed it as like, this is an exciting time for app making. This, uh, the iPhone was just coming out, the iPhone SDK was just coming out, the App Store, like at the time we all thought the App Store was gonna be like, you know, this, going to completely revolutionize, like everyone was going to be able to have these indie businesses, you know, because the App Store was going to be this distribution channel that was going to make that all possible. Um, you know, obviously the iPhone was going to open up huge new industries and things like that. Um, and much like Coppola, I had a whole bunch of ideas that I wanted to work on that were sort of like my real ideas. Uh, but 
I was like, you know what? I need a, a quick money maker uh, so that I can like shore shore my uh, my business up, and then I can work on the other ideas that I uh, I want to work on. Um, and so, like a like the genius I am, I decided Twitter clients. A Twitter client would be a good uh, quick thing that'll make a lot of money. People love them. Uh, you know, I, I wasn't necessarily like, I didn't view like doing a Twitter client as like, you know, this is my life purpose or something like that. Um, I, I was, I just thought it would be, and oh, and also my brother had, uh, pocket tweets. So I was like, why don't I do a native version of pocket tweets? Um, so, hmm, this is a little out of order. Well, anyway, I'll, okay. So I'll, I'll get to that in a second, but, um, oh, right. Okay. So actually the other thing I should explain, I'm very loosely prepared for this. Um, my uh, <clears throat> my brother was supposed to be the original designer. He was a designer of pocket tweets, very talented. He was supposed to design bird feed, or what became bird feed. But um, he worked for Apple at the time, he worked on mobile me. And at Apple, you have to get permission from your director uh, if you want to do an outside thing. Uh, his director was Eddie Q, um, who, you know, depending on who you ask, is not a nice guy. Um, and uh, especially since uh, they had hired him on the basis of pocket tweets and who knows, like the, they were sort of the web services part of Apple, um, I think uh, Eddie Q felt that it would not be appropriate for him to work on this thing. So my brother kind of <laughs> dragged his feet about it and I'm sitting there writing code, writing code, putting more, investing more and more into it. And then finally he's like, I'm sorry, Eddie Q says I can't do it. Also, Eddie Q was the guy who basically ran the app store, so <laughs> I, was, I wasn't sure I wanted to run afoul of him by, by trying to do it anyway. So anyway, so <clears throat> uh, I ended up approaching my friend Nevin and asking him to do it. And Nevin had done one of the most popular um, iOS to-do list apps, I think, at the time, like a web-based to-do list app. And so, so Nevin signed on. It, one of the first things that we became aware of is the name Pocket Tweets was not only kind of a little bit awkward, but way too long for the iPhone like display. Like that's just too long of a word. And um, also because of the weird connection to my brother, we sort of wanted to like change the the name. So Nevin and I kept uh, trying to think of a new name, and we went around and around and about it. And most of the um, uh, the Twitter apps that were around at the time. Uh, had really awful names like Twiddlator Pro and you know uh, stuff like that. They, th things that uh, like used Twit a lot or you know just like really horrible sounding words. Um, and so we wanted to do something different. And um, we we thought about it and thought about it. And then finally, I was visiting Devon in Portland, and one day we hit on it. Bird feed. It was like a brilliant like it works on several levels. You know, it's a feed, Twitter, birds. You know, the whole thing. Um, and so. Uh, we immediately kind of like sketched out um, the, the icon concept came just like that. It was like, oh, what if it's like a birdhouse with a little, you know, voice bubble? Um, and we were so pleased with ourselves that we had come up with this. And we immediately got on IM and talked to our friend uh, Adam Lissagor, uh, who happened to be building another Twitter app at the time uh, that was for that it was different. It was more like drafts. It was kind of a draft centric thing, um, and. Uh, we were like, we came up with our name, uh, Bird Feed. And he's like, what? Uh, sort of a Don Draper what there. Um, and uh, <clears throat> he was like, the icon isn't like a birdhouse, is it? Uh, <laughs> and we were like, as a matter of fact. Um, and uh, so it turned out that they had decided to call their app Birdhouse and had a very similar icon. And so that was like one of the first things that we're like, oh God, like what are we gonna do? But we both liked our names so much that we're like, we're keeping it, we're keeping it. Um, and so, let's see. So then we, uh, you know, we had the branding nailed down with, you know, a little bit of a problem there. Then we moved on to design. And this is probably, you'll have to indulge me, this is probably the longest part of the presentation. Um, the, um, uh, the interesting thing that's easy to forget today is at the time, I started this before the iOS SDK really came out. Like nobody had really seen a lot of iPhone apps, like besides the ones app Apple had made. Um, like today, we totally take it for granted. We know what a, uh, a Twitter client looks like, what a social networking client looks like. But at the time, it was not obvious like how it should work. And in fact, I think when I was going through my um, old mockups and stuff today, I even found one that had in the header like page one, page two. I, I had actually made a prototype of this where you like paged uh, like a book 
um, in, your, in your timeline, like rather than scrolling to the bottom and like having it load more. Um, so that was kind of weird. Um, and you can see this version is way more, this version I believe my brother actually designed, um, and it's way more uh, pocket tweetsy, like polished. Um, and uh <coughs> we did, the, uh, the, the background color stayed um, mostly the same. And that was something I always struggled a little bit with. Uh, one of my friends told me, who worked for Apple, told me a story that he got in an elevator with Steve Jobs. And Steve asked him what app he was using. And he said, bird feed. And um, Steve took the phone and looked at it. And the one piece of feedback he had is that there should be more texture in the timeline background, <laughs> which is actually something I always kind of felt too, but we never really quite nailed that down. Uh, but yeah, anyway, this version is also, you know, you can see it's very web-like. It's got the, uh, the text field at the top. It's almost kind of like a, a literal translation of, of pocket tweets. And then at the bottom, it has the tab bar, um, which is something, and this gets to another thing about um, bird feed. Nevin and I were very, and this, this, is, this almost maybe brings us to the second major problem, which is uh, Nevin and I were very, very purist in our approach. Like, we were very determined to toe the line about, um, we decided we didn't want a tab bar, we didn't like them. Uh, I, you, you might say we, uh, we anticipated the basement and hamburger icon by, by many years. Um, and uh, <clears throat> we also were just, the, the sort of guiding design principle we had was we wanted it to look like the iPhone client that would have come with your, uh, with your iPhone, like if Apple had made it. So, Oh, and th this is uh, just like what a tweet looked like. Again, it's a little, eh. um, So then Nevin and I started working on it and kind of stripping it down, <laughs> simplifying it. Oh, this is what, sorry, I don't know my own slides. This is what the posting interface looked like. Again, this is very like pocket tweets. Um, all right, so that's what the timeline of originally, uh, eventually looked like. Um, the, uh, took a lot of the crazy gloss and stuff out of, uh, uh, out of the, um, the cells and stuff. Uh, <clears throat> Let's see. So again, we got rid of the tab bar. Um, we used a, and this is something at the time people kind of, I think, didn't like about us. But, uh, well, some people liked it. But uh, we got a lot of pressure about this. Um, we had a, you know, a very sort of like basement type approach where everything, instead of being in a tab bar, was in this sort of like back menu. Um, oh, this is, so this is another idea I had. Um, obviously, in Twitter, you have to, Twitter clients, you have to deal with the gaps. Uh, like if you have cached tweets and then you, you load, like you don't load your, your feed for like two days, uh, you end up with a gap. And so this was my way of handling the, uh, the gap, uh, which I worked really, really hard to do it that way. And I think nobody ever really appreciated it. <laughs> but uh, um, let's see. Um, yeah, so that's what our in reply to thing looked like. Um, this is, yeah, kind of like what a tweet detail view looked like. Um, oh, another thing I was going to point out is we had that weird um, sort of snap back to timeline uh, birdhouse icon, which is another thing that um, I think we very much thought was going to catch on. Like, people were going to be like, those guys are pretty smart. Every iPhone app's going to have that now. But nope, nope, didn't really <laughs> catch on. Uh, turns out it's not that much of a problem. But it's <laughs> something we, we went out of our way to accommodate. Um, this is one thing I actually, and if, if you take nothing else away from this talk, what I'd like you to take away is that I believe I invented that uh, sort of mini profile with the arrow thing, <laughs> which, is, uh, which is actually in like all social networking apps now. Like it's become a very common pattern. I, I really struggled with that sort of like navigation and that's kind of the solution I came up with using that disclosure button. Um, the other thing you see a lot here is I, I had, um, uh, I only had, Nevin was starting at Panic, so I only had a little bit of his time as a designer. And so I kind of sometimes had to make do with like uh, standard stock iOS things tastefully positioned. So even though that was our general concept, uh, like stock stuff, it was also partly motivated by the fact that I only had limited time for my designer. Um, yeah, that's what the posting interface looked like. Um, I was pretty proud of that. Nevin and I were very proud of that. Uh, sort of like character count meter there. Oh yeah, this is another thing that I think we uh, did better, I think possibly even than anyone else today, <laughs> um, was uh, the, um, 
the direct message interface, which I really just literally wanted to look like the SMS app. Um, and it, it still, I think, maintains state better than the current Twitter client does. Um, yeah, another thing we invented was this concept of services, um, which actually is sort of coming back a little bit, uh, some of the announcements they made uh, for I at WWDC this year. Um, the idea here was like, the Twitter at the time was very different. It was like full of, uh, <laughs> Twitter was like an ecosystem at the time, whereas now it's kind of become a product and we wanted to try to tie a lot of like third party services in. So we had sort of a services menu on profiles and tweets and stuff like that where you could like take that object and send it to other services and, and do stuff with it. Um, okay, this, all right, this brings me to, uh, Th this brings me to something that is, all right, this is finally the point of like a lot of this design talk. Um, so again, Nevin and I were, were very, very purist and suspicious of, of what you might call UI novelty. Um, and <clears throat> but one thing we struggled with was uh, where to put the refresh button. Uh, if, it <laughs> if, and I think this is where ultimately the whole pull to refresh thing came from. Um, if you had a button in the upper right for posting, it was like, where do you put the, uh, where do you put the refresh button? Unless you want to have like two buttons in the nav bar, which is like a weird thing. And Cable Sasser from Panic actually suggested to us, why don't you do, you know, the tables do the rubber banding thing. Why don't you like have a thing where you pull down to refresh? Um, and Nevin and I thought about it for two days, but we were like such purists that we were basically like, that's too cute. I don't want it. I don't, I don't want it in my app. Um, so we didn't do pull to refresh, a decision we later came to regret. Um, that's what we actually did. We just did a, a nice, tasteful load more button. Um, oh yeah, okay, so this is another thing that's sort of part of bird feed lore. Um, we, uh, w at the time, we were so confident in ourselves that we wanted to do uh, an Easter egg, and the whole idea for this was, um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the, uh, the whole Mr. Macintosh thing. Um, it, it, is anybody familiar with that? Has, has anybody heard about Mr. Macintosh? Okay, not that many, still. Well, the, the whole, there's a story on, on uh, folklore.org, the sort of like Apple history site about how Steve Jobs came up with this idea that uh, he wanted to have this guy called Mr. Macintosh, who was supposed to be like, the little man who lived in your computer. And it, it was just, I, I love this story because it's like complete Steve Jobs at his most cockamamie. Like, uh, but he was like, every, you know, hundredth time you pull down a menu or something, Mr. Macintosh will appear and like wink at you or something like that or wave. Um, and so Nevin and I had some vague idea that um, you'd somehow be able to trig trigger like Mr. Macintosh mode uh, that would put it into this kind of like 8 bit, uh, you know. Uh, Mac uh, UI. That never got implemented. But I still own the uh, Mr. Macintosh Twitter account. So nice. never, never known what to do with it. Um, all right, so now moving on to the, so that was sort of the, the background of the design. That was the longest part. Thanks for sitting through that. Um, the engineering, um, all right, so uh, <laughs> I don't know how many of you were, were doing iOS programming back in like the early days of, uh, of, of the iOS, but um, a lot of us were just like waiting for the SDK to come out because we're like, yes, this is going to be awesome. We're going to rock this. Um, then when you actually got your hands on the SDK, it was kind of a rude shock because uh, performance was a huge problem. Um, you didn't have access to uh, like surprising stock controls, right? You'd think, I'm, I'm going to use like one of those things and it'd be like, nope, you have to re-implement it yourself. Um, it was, uh, scrolling performance turned out to be a major problem. Um, it basically, <laughs> uh, it w I did not expect to be dealing with what I was dealing with. Um, the other decision that I sort of made <clears throat> early on was, um, oh yeah, that's <laughs> some old tweets there, um, was that uh, I wanted to um, be the first Twitter client uh, one of my tentpole features that I wanted to do is to be the first Twitter client that supported local caching. And um, at the time, uh, Core Data, which is sort of the standard iOS like uh, framework for storage, was not on the phone. 
And um, <clears throat> so rather than just sort of being like, okay, well, whatever, I'll just write some SQLite code, I was a little bit hubristic, and um, I decided to write my own object relational mapping system. Uh, now, this, this dovetails very nicely with the Apocalypse Now aspect of the talk, because there's this old quote about how object relational mapping is the Vietnam of computer science or the tech industry. Um, I basically went down a crazy rabbit trail of like, I'm gonna write my own ORM, it's gonna be great, I'm gonna solve all the problems, th all the things I don't like about core data, um, and I also convinced myself to do it based on like, and I wanna do other apps, so like, this is actually like a good investment. Like this is, this is, <laughs> this is the sensible thing to do. Um, so that was a mistake. Um, yeah, and I guess I put this, I wasn't sure how else to put this, but uh, I think one of the hardest problems I had to solve really was just my own hubris. Um, I, I really felt like I, I am uniquely qualified to solve this problem. Like, I've got the Twitter background, I've got uh, the uh, hardcore Mac development background, like not many other people who are gonna be trying to do this have what I have. Um, and so I got a little cocky, I worked on the ORM thing. Um, I don't know if I, oh yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the other thing that I got really, really obsessed with was um, performance, which was a real problem, as I mentioned, on the early iPhone. The hardware was very constrained, the memory was very constrained. Um, and years ago, I was at the, uh, the keynote, where the, the WWC keynote, where they, or maybe it was Macworld, where they introduced Safari, and one of the things that I really remember sort of capturing my imagination as a young engineer was that they had had a zero regression performance policy uh, with, with Safari, where basically uh, they, they had like a sophisticated series of, of performance uh, metrics, and if anybody checked anything in that regressed that at all, it had to be fixed. And so I was like, I'm gonna hold myself to that. Um, and just in the early days of iOS development, that turned out to be a really unrealistic thing, especially while I'm trying to uh, you know, implement UI and like do all this, uh, um, do a lot of other things that I really should have been concentrating on rather than freaking out because I caused like a, you know, a quarter second regression or something in the, uh, uh, the ORM code. Um, so around this time, and I'm sorry I don't have a slide for this, I, I couldn't, I actually found I couldn't remember the names of a lot of the early like Twitter clients, but you know, there were things like Twitterlator, um, there were a bunch of people coming, coming out with stuff, but <clears throat> none of them were quite hitting the mark. Um, the first one, let me see, okay. Uh, the first one um, out of the gate was Twitterific. Uh, the problem with Twitterific was it was way too much, it was basically a literal translation of the desktop app, and it was slow as hell. And I think some of my assumptions about performance and stuff were based on like, wow, nobody likes Twitterific because it's so slow, I've gotta be like obsessive about performance. Um, so uh, that was the first one, but then that, that left an obvious, that didn't really hit the mark, so it left an obvious gap in the market. And I like to think that Twitter clients at that time were a little bit like um, the way uh, photo sharing was when Instagram came out, right? Like when Instagram came out, it was sort of like, wait, why did the, there's Flickr, like why did this become successful? But I think nobody had quite hit what photo sharing should be on iOS yet. And I think there was a gap that existed for a very short period of time here where people were trying, but nobody was quite hitting it. Um, so around this time, I also started getting feedback uh, from various people, John Gruber, uh, things like that. I got a lot of conflicting feedback. Um, I got uh, people telling me that they wanted it to just be like Twitter client X or Twitter, Twitter client Y. Um, and that was uh, <clears throat> a little bit hard for me to reconcile, especially as I'm starting to kind of like lose confidence a little bit. Um, and then uh, next into this uh, comes Jack Dorsey, who I had known for a while, and this is probably the really juicy part of the talk, so. Um, especially, especially if you've ever, uh, you know, if you read the, the Twitter book, but um, I met Jack, uh, I, well, I, I sort of knew Jack before, but I started hanging out with Jack a lot around the time uh, he came uh, he, well, around the time, it turns out he was fired from Twitter. I was, I didn't really necessarily know that at the time. But uh, he, was, he was spending a lot of time in New York and I, I would see him every time he came. Um, and, <clears throat> oh, here's a 
photo I have of him at uh, Employees Only, which is a, a bar in New York City consulting a fortune teller. I like to think it's a very representative photo of where Jack was at that time in his life. Um, and I, I think uh, Jack was really looking for a way uh, it, it, it makes a lot more sense now in retrospect, I think, especially after I've, I've read, you know, the book we've all read and stuff, but I think Jack was, was kind of like looking for his way back into Twitter in a lot of ways, um, and he was kind of look, looking for something else to kind of like um, grab onto, and, um, I, you know, I talked to him a lot about bird feed, and at this point, uh, Jack told me something that, I, I, that really shocked me at the time, although in retrospect, you know, again, not that surprising, but... Um, one time we were sitting there talking about bird feed and he was like, you know, Twitter as a company has no product direction. They take everything from client developers. Um, you can push Twitter with a client. Um, and I was like, wow, that's a really shocking thing for you to say as the chairman of Twitter. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but, but uh, you know, again, if you know more about what's going on, it makes sense. Um, so Jack started, um, giving me a lot of feedback. I put a slide of the dick bar in here, um, <laughs> which, which you, you may remember, um, because the biggest piece of feedback that I, I really feel like, and I have no idea what the actual origins of the dick bar were, but um, <clears throat> the, uh, I, the major feedback that I got from Jack was basically trends. Trends are the future of Twitter. Trends everywhere. Put trends front and center. Trends in people's face. and. Uh, I was a little dubious about that. I, I considered it, uh, all, but I was not all that impressed with the quality of Twitter trends at the time. So I, um, I did some experiments with it, but I ultimately buried it, which he didn't like, and then I think he sort of lost interest in it. It, it got to the point where um, I was really spinning my wheels, and this again is very similar to Coppola, uh, I like to think, in Apocalypse Now. Like, it got to the point where Coppola was in, in the jungles of, uh, uh, in the Philippines, um, changing the script, rewriting the script, writing new pages, trying to figure out what to do, like really freaked out, spinning his wheels left and right, um, and, and really kind of getting to the point where he was starting to doubt himself. Like he was, it, it was dragging on and on, and he went in very confident, kind of like I went in very confident, and uh, he, by, at that point he really started to, to kind of lose it. Um, and of course, at that point, uh, he, the thing he was really holding out hope for was like, once, once we have Marlon Brando, everything will be fine. But Marlon Brando showed up and was like 100 pounds overweight and uh, a little incoherent and kind of just spent a lot of time uh, ad-libbing and kind of fucking around, basically. So didn't, didn't really save Coppola's bacon. So th this is the point where he's really starting to freak out. The point where I started to really freak out is when Tweety came out. Um, now, <clears throat> the thing about Tweety, and this is, I think, another important sort of lesson you can take away from this. Um, the first version of it, I, the first version of Bird Feed, I was dead set. It had to be certain things. I had my, like, tentpole features that I would not compromise on. It was going to have local caching. It wasn't just going to be, uh, you remember my point about Instagram, like, where you just needed something that filled the gap, that, that just hit the market just right, right? Well, that's not what I was trying to do. Like, what I was trying to do uh, was basically, I, I'm going to create the greatest Twitter client of all time. I was, like, super ambitious. What Lauren did, basically, was, I think, very surgically looked at the market and was basically like, all right, the first person who comes out with something that does everything Twitter is supposed to do, because this is another th point I forgot to make earlier about some of the competition, that... Uh, the early Twitter clients were all designed with, in an era of Twitter scarcity, right? Like, at the time, Twitter severely rate-limited its API. The API was really limited. Um, and the apps that came out were designed around that idea of, like, you can't just make arbitrary HTTP requests. You can't, like, every request is precious, right? Well, I think the window of Twitter fixing its problems and Lauren coming along just hit exactly right he basically did, he, he did a perfect minimum viable product. Like he, he basically was like, I'm gonna make something that does all the major functions that Twitter is supposed to do, and it's fast. And this is another thing that I think is sort of interesting about um, the, the things that I was really concentrating on were things that for me were like very kind of like, um, 
relate, you know, related to Twitter, like uh, data and networking and things like that. I was like, th these are things I'm good at. This is why I'll be successful. But it turned out one of the interesting things about the problem at the time was one of the major complaints, again, that everyone had was performance. And it just so happened that a lot of that was graphics performance, and Lauren was a graphics engineer, um, which made him in a sort of like non-obvious way kind of like a per the best person to solve this problem. Um, I think he, he gets a lot of credit for like UI experimentation and stuff, and that's part of it. But I think in some ways, at this time, like iOS development was like folklore. Like you really didn't know, like nobody knew how to make fast scrolling tables. It was like uh, you'd read blog posts about it, and people had different theories, but you didn't really know. Apple's documentation was scarce. Lauren had worked at Apple. He sort of he knew how to make this fast. Um, um, so at this point, I entered uh, again, you know, kind of like Coppola, there's just like the shipping doldrums. And the worst thing that happened is uh, the second thing that Lauren was really good at is he iterated like a maniac. Like he basically, he got something out that just hit the market just right and then moved really, really fast and just kind of like, he also, uh, whereas Nevin and I were like very kind of like purist, he was also very accommodating. He was like, oh yeah, sure, I'll put that in the app, I'll put that in the app. Nevin and I were like, no, no, we must maintain the purity. So. Um, he really kind of like sewed up the market that way, I think. Meanwhile, um, I'm trying to, sh to ship, and this is actually something my wife said to me um, at, in the worst of this. Like, she didn't actually follow through on that. I didn't ship, and she didn't follow through. Although, she actually is saying she may still someday. Uh, so, <laughs> we'll see. Um, actually, I should make one more point here, which is that then I got into a really bad situation, again, that was kind of like, Coppola getting further and further mired in Apocalypse Now and sort of like being at the point of no return where he, he had to finish it because uh, he it had started out so, as something that he was going to do just like, oh, this will be my quick thing and it became his life, his obsession, like what he was sinking all of his money into. That's kind of what bird feed became for me at this time and part of the reason for that is the more Lauren did, it just kept moving the bar for me to ship. Like everything suddenly, okay, well now he did this, now not only do I have to complete my incredibly ambitious app, I have to do this on top of that. It kept just making the whole thing bigger and bigger. But eventually, I finally did launch. Um, now, BirdFeed's launch was kind of an interesting thing. It was actually really successful, believe it or not. This is, this is one of the bright sides in the story. Matt Buchanan there, by the way, has become like, he was kind of like my best, uh, my best critic and uh, he's kind of become a friend today. Uh, I don't have a Twitter app anymore, so it's not conflict of interest. But um, uh, anyway, um, it came out, and it actually, you know, it really, people praised it for being fast. Uh, they said it was minimal, uh, but, you know, but it's very fast and focused and well-designed, and you'll like it. I also was the benefit of a little bit of a weird kind of like accidental viral marketing campaign. Because um, I had a Twitter account for it set up, and it had the icon, and people liked the icon, and people, a bunch of people, I don't even know how they were finding it, just followed the Twitter account. And by the time it launched, there were actually people like checking the App Store every day, every day to see if Birdbeat was out yet and stuff. And so when it finally came out, there was this, and I, I don't think I could have done this intentionally, but there was this big groundswell of like interest in it, uh, and it, it actually kind of blew up and became fairly successful. Um, so, but, that only lasted for a while because then Lauren came along and all the stuff that I was like killing myself to be like, I've got to have this in 1.0, I've got to have this in 1.0. Well, he did it in 2.0. And then <laughs> even my good friend Matt Buchanan betrayed me. Um, <laughs> he was at Gizmodo at the time. Um, but uh, so yeah, um, at, at that point, okay, hold on. So at that point, um, it was pretty much like the mind share had been captured. It was pretty obvious that the, uh, the founders of Twitter um, were, were behind it um, and that I was really not going to, to catch up at that point. And I, oh, actually, one, one more point I wanted to make about why I think Lauren kind of sewed up the market was um, he, he changed the game a little bit to... Uh, <laughs> to be about, I guess what I call sort of somewhat derisively UI novelty. Um, again, it was a period where, uh, but I think this is another area where he sort of knew the market better than me. Um, 
he uh, obviously like pull to refresh is like you know the classic example, but you know by the end he was doing crazy stuff like this, um, <laughs> which uh, to me again tr tr uh, to me like trying to be a purist, this this kind of stuff drove me crazy, but it's the kind of stuff that gets every uh, you know web product guy to write about you on their blog, you know to get tech journalists to to write about you. Um, he, I, but I think he recognized a, uh, that, that at that time, UI novelty, like the, the, the touch environment, iOS was new, and this is actually kind of like what's, you know, <laughs> what's old. The last, sort of the, the last hurrah of bird feed was uh, my old friend Jack actually um, got me the opportunity to be uh, the sort of test bed for Twitter geolocation, which, I think we did a pretty nice job of in a lot of ways. Um, uh, I'm still kind of fond of that bar at the top, um, and uh, y but it got it got sort of minor promotion by by Twitter and uh, didn't really <laughs> didn't really go anywhere. I was supposed to be in the WWC keynote, but that got bumped. Um, then the next thing that sort of happened was Twitter finally kind of woke up out of its <laughs> sort of product stupor that it had been in. Um, Lists came out, retweets came out. It's weird to think that this was like before retweets came out. Um, but uh, <clears throat> anyway, that, that started happening and then suddenly now not only, it, it, it felt like I was fighting a war on two fronts now. Uh, there was, uh, on one hand I was trying to keep up with Lauren and then on the other hand I was trying to keep up with, with Twitter which was now <laughs> moving rapidly in different directions. And so <clears throat> at that point, um, <laughs> At that point, uh, I started talking to a company called Thing Labs, uh, which was run by some people who were sort of Twitter insiders and um, confided to me that they had heard some rumblings about Twitter acquiring Tweety. And so I <coughs> ultimately decided, somewhat under pressure, but somewhat not, to go ahead and sell BirdFeed. Um, they had a web-based Twitter client called Brizzly, and they wanted um, uh, BirdFeed to be the sort of like iOS component of that. So I sold it to them. Um, now I'm definitely not one of those people, I'm not a fan of the genre of kind of like writing about like someone acquired my thing and ruined it because it's like, you know, well you sold it. I mean you, you should have known what happened and it's what might happen, it's not yours anymore. Um, they did, I'm not thrilled with what they did with it but I think they had their reasons but uh, <laughs> this is my favorite. I might actually bring, the, um, bring this up on my phone and read you more. Um, <laughs> but uh, some of the, uh, Birdfeed did have its loyal fan base and um, this was some of the reaction. Uh, my favorite part, I've got to find the part, um, this guy wrote a really over the top and I think some of it was somewhat tongue in cheek. But uh, my, favorite, my favorite part uh, is where he said, and from his ivory tower that stands in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, surrounded by throngs of hipsters, he preached his sermons of douchebaggery and declared me a dick for not understanding the genius of his design and expecting too much too soon. So, so people were pissed off. Uh, and then after that, uh, Twitter bought Tweety, which I think sort of somewhat uh, bore out my decision to sell. Uh, and then, oh yeah, okay, so I, I thought about putting this earlier. Um, uh, but I, I think it's a good capper. Um, this is like a, a famous quote from Coppola in the movie uh, that I think sort of sums up my experience a little bit. There, there were too many of us, <laughs> well actually the preamble to this is he says, uh, he speak, I think he's speaking at the Cannes Film Festival and he says, um, my movie is not about Vietnam, doing my Coppola impression here, my movie is not about Vietnam, my movie is Vietnam. We were in, we were in Vietnam like the US was in Vietnam there were too many of us, we had access to too much equipment, too much money, and little by little we went insane. So I feel like that's sort of a little bit what happened to me, except it was like not money and equipment, it was like developer hubris basically. Um, but, you know, Apocalypse Now, uh, it's, it's still a, a well-respected movie, uh, even though at the time it was not really appreciated and it almost drove the person who made it crazy. I'm, I'm proud of uh, the influence I've had on Twitter and uh, other Twitter apps. Um, I like to tell people that I, I think of uh, Birdfeed as sort of the, the velvet underground of Twitter clients. That uh, <laughs> uh, not that many people bought it, but uh, it you know it was very influential. Um, oh, and uh, 
just to show that my friend Matt eventually came back to the fold after after Twitter did some stuff he didn't like with their client recently, he wrote this. <laughs> um, so yeah, I didn't really make slides for this, but um, I guess you know the biggest thing I, I wanted to say about what I learned about this is that uh, I guess you know the, the simple lesson is that I really didn't anticipate the market right. Like I, I really didn't read the market right. But I think there's also a real tendency in talks like this to sort of like give a lot of received knowledge and sort of um, be very glib about things. And I don't know, like I think one of the things I take away from it is part of what makes it difficult to do what we all do, I'm, I'm assuming what we all do in here, is um, the, what, what may have been right in one instance is not necessarily right in, in another. And uh, for example, in, in some situations that were not like the, the weird artificial situation of Twitter clients circa 2009, um, it, it may have been the right decision for me to like stick to my guns about um, doing uh, per, you know, uh, local caching and things like that. Um, but I didn't really know, I didn't really know the game that I was in. Um, so I guess maybe that's part of it is know the game you're in. Um, but it's very hard. Like sometimes it's really hard when you're in the middle of this uh, to know sort of like what the right decision is. The same thing about like you know the ORM thing. I I don't. I, what I have now is not an ORM, but I uh, I definitely have my own pretty evolved persistence code that I, I'm a I'm a I do client work today and actually have a, a giant library of code that my business partner and I use in all of our projects. So I don't even, like I think with software developers, there's a little bit of a tendency to sort of be like, you ain't gonna need it, don't generalize it, blah, blah, blah. But it's like, you know what, sometimes, uh, you know, in the right circumstance, that can actually be a very valuable thing. It's just not when you're competing like this. Um, yeah, so I guess, I guess that's it. <laughs> I guess that's my point. Um, yeah, I don't know. Questions? Is it is it question time? Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. What Twitter client do you use now? Oh, the, the official Twitter client. Yeah. I mean, my my personal opinion on that. Well, actually, I've never liked the other ones, right? I mean, I I, I really honestly don't like. I've never liked the robot one, and uh, um, the uh, partly just I I don't know. Like, just the design, I don't really like. Like, it's it's a little too cute for me, like uh, I've never liked the sort of robot branding, the, the weird bird like <laughs> thing that looks like it's gonna, I don't know, like suck your face or something. Like I, I, I don't know, I've never never liked it. Well, I'm gonna, all right, this is the part of the talk I'm really gonna get in trouble for. Um, I, I'm not a fan of, of, uh, of Tweetbot um, and yeah, Twitterific I respect, but um, I, I've never, liked the sort of integrated DM approach or like a lot of the visual design. And, um, and also, I guess the last thing I'd say about it is just basically that, you know, th this is a different era. Like at that time, Twitter was dry, or clients were driving Twitter. That's not really true anymore. I mean, Twitter is now an integrated service that the client is evolving in lockstep with. And, you know, I want the new stuff. Unlike some people, I actually, I like what you guys are doing at Twitter these days. <laughs> yeah, Any, anything else? Any other questions? <laughs> I am curious about oh. how you're some of the development uh, with this compared to some of the work that you've been doing at bigger companies like, well, I guess Square mm. was smaller at that time. Uh, yeah. Or, uh, what sort of differences you've seen between those two? What things you prefer? Oh, and yeah. And so Oh, you mean like in terms of like development, uh, like process yeah, or? Yeah, well, the, the sort of things you observed when you were at those places versus working on your own and what sort of things that like yeah. you would be motivated to do. You know, I've definitely become a lot more disciplined, I think, than I was back then, just kind of like working by myself. Like Square, I actually uh, worked with a guy, uh, Tristan O'Tierney, who is a real stickler for, for coding style and things like that. Like you know, I definitely, um, you know, I had worked at Apple before that. Um, that was where my, my primary experience was. And Apple is like super ad hoc about, like, there's no, like, pe people are always asking me, like, so does Apple use Agile? Like, what do you mean? It's like, no, no, it's pretty, like, you know, you get your work done. Like, that's kind of the development <laughs> philosophy. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, that said, I mean, it's, it's easy to be, 
All right. Yeah, I mean, I feel like you're almost kind of baiting me here with this question because I suspect you know. I, I, well, because I know Bill and I suspect I, I, he, he knows my feelings. But, uh, Square, on the other hand, was like about uh, as diametrically opposed to that as you could be in the sense that it was uh, all of the early engineering team were like hardcore, pivotal, uh, like test-driven development, born-again, agile scrum masters. Um, and uh, and I, I really am not a fan of, of that, um, especially, you know, like Square was very into like, in, in the beginning, they don't, they'll be very quick to tell you they don't do this today, but um, in the beginning it was very like everyone pairs, like uh, we want, even on the iOS stuff, like we want like 100% test coverage and you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, I don't know, I guess, I guess, I feel like I'm giving a rambling answer to this, but um, I think in the early days of Square, I, I, I had come from a very ad hoc way of doing things uh, and gone into this very kind of like structured, like agile thing. Um, I think some level of that I've come to sort of like appreciate. Um, but I also think the interesting thing about like the era when I was at Square was I think it was the first time that um, people who were like me, who were like native client, like native like Mac developers, like C programmers, were being thrown into in close quarters with people who were part of this like long evolved tradition of server work that's uh, uh, that that comes out of a very different language tradition, you know, dynamic languages, um, which is why you know unit testing is important. Like when I started at Square, like I was just like, my God, these people are obsessed with unit testing. Um, but uh, which you know certainly there's a place for that in the iOS world, but I think one of the things that frustrated me a little bit was there was not a lot of recognition for like how what we did was culturally different, right? Like C, you know, you have a type system, you, uh, it, it's a little, if you're writing like good C code, it's not quite as important. Um, um, yeah, let's see, Tumblr, uh, I don't know if I really have anything to say about that. Um, it, it, Tumblr was way more just kind of like, it, it, was, it started out as a pretty small team. Like, uh, in fact, yeah, it was, it was really just me and, and Justin Willette for a while. Um, and um, so we were pretty ad hoc. But Square, I will admit, for a while I had a bit of a chip on my shoulder about like the sort of like, don't try to tie me down with your agile. <laughs> so. Yeah. Your clients out, you're also helping dictate product direction for them. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And you obviously can do that a lot when you're doing uh, work. Yeah. Oh, okay. I see. I see what you're getting at. There. Yeah. But I'm wondering how different was that between a smaller company, uh, like startup, basically in those days, for Square, um, and, and what you're doing now. You, what I'm doing now, you mean like client work or? Yeah. Not really. In fact, one of the things, <laughs> it's probably going to be a very disappointing answer, but one of the things I actually like about client work is that it's very mercenary and I don't really feel terribly invested in, <laughs> this is a horrible advertisement for my consulting company. <laughs> <laughs> We're very mercenary and we don't really feel terribly invested in what you're doing. <laughs> Hire us. Um, no, but it, it's not in the same way that, you know, like um, Tumblr, I almost put another, if I did a presentation about Tumblr, um, I, I would put another filmmaking quote that I like in, which about another famous filmmaking failure that I like a lot, which is, um, well, we all know, like the, the Dune uh, documentary just came out, um, and Dune is another one of these movies that has a real history of like, sorry, I'm getting very parabolic here with this, but um, I, I guess there's this, in, in his book, uh, Catching the Big Fish, David Lynch has this uh, quote where he says something like, you know, if, if you, if you if you make something that you love and you fail, like you, <laughs> I'm gonna totally mangle this. But uh, if you make you you can still respect yourself. But if you make something that you don't like and it's not successful, then it's like you've failed twice. And um, <clears throat> that's a little bit like how I felt about um, well, really both some of what I. <laughs> 
well, especially Tumblr, which is long, that's a whole other story, but uh, um, that's way too much to get into. But um, I, think, I think that's probably what I mean there, that like, I sort of like the fact now that I can do, I can concentrate on the engineering and I don't have to worry too much about like, the product didn't come out like I want it to or, or something like that. So I don't know, that may not be a good, uh, we, can, we can talk about this afterward. Uh, I don't know, sorry, that was a really long. Are you, yeah, yeah, do do two yeah. more. Uh, if, if it's a okay. Yeah. You said you started the open systems framework before Cordata was on the. Uh, yeah. I'm curious whether your whether it's evolved to back onto Cordata or not. It, yeah, actually, I okay. So that's an uh, that's a whole. All of these things are things <laughs> I could talk for hours about. But um, yeah, I do use Cordata now, and in fact, um, I I've built this kind of. I guess what I would call a protective shell around core data that like puts it in a box <laughs> that makes it hard to screw up. Because core data to me is like one of the world's great leaky abstractions. It's almost kind of like the definition of leaky abstraction. It's one of these things that like if you really use it the way it makes you think you can use it, like a lot of ORMs, right? Like this is one of the classic like active record or any, any of these things. Like if you use them naively, um, you're gonna screw up. Um, so yeah, I've kind of built a nice abstraction for core data that uh, that kind of just puts all that in a box. Um, you know, I wouldn't mind revisiting uh, the whole issue someday when I when I have a lot of time. Um, I I'll be really interested to see what Apple's future commitment to core data is because in a lot of ways it's like the reason it wasn't originally on the iPhone was I think at the time it was perceived to be a poor match for the environment of the iPhone like performance-wise, memory-wise, things like that. And obviously the hardware has gotten to the point where that's not as much of a problem. But it's also like core data is like this weird relic of, it's like the dream of the 90s is alive. And you know, it, it comes out of Enterprise Objects Framework, which was like a, you know, Enterprise Java Beans competitor, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's kind of antiquated stuff. So, um, but yeah, for now I've gotten, actually one of our clients, um, is this uh, is like the most core data intensive app I've ever seen, um, and we didn't build the app. We just came in to help them disentangle their core data problems because it's so easy to to mess up with it. Um, yeah, I, th I think it's just like doing multi-threaded stuff with it's really hard. Like it, it just I don't know. It's it's not very modern. I don't know. Anyway, what I could go on and on about it. I'll tell you later too. Um, <laughs> all right. Yeah. So yeah. So my question. For you. I was like, we gotta let him ask a question. I think Jordan was probably one of my, my biggest fans yeah, so, with, with so Red Food, by the way. So, yeah. The second that uh, basic auth is turned off. Mm -hmm. uh, it's almost, almost four years ago today. I so appreciate that, man. For you is what's the thing that you miss the most uh, from the app that we no longer have? Oh. Mm. That, that no longer exists in your computer. That's a good question. I mean, it, it's, it's interesting because Twitter is almost such a different right. beast now in a lot of ways than it was back then. I mean, when I was preparing that presentation today, I was like, Oh yeah, retweets like that <laughs> became a thing while I was developing bird feed. Like, um, let's see, I don't know. I really liked my DM thing. Um, I think that was one of the things I just, in my opinion, did better than than anyone else. Were, at that time, were there any other uh, that did a conversational? Yeah, no, mine I believe was the first that that ever did it conversationally. And I was really this is another one of these things that I just went to ridiculous lengths to. I was like it's got to work just like SMS. Like I want it to literally be, and it, this was the other thing too, is like at the time you were fighting against like, like you guys have the luxury of being able to sort of be like, oh, can you make some API for that? And they'll be like, okay. Um, I mean, I guess I, they may, they may, it may not be, it's usually not quite that clean with me when I deal with clients. So, but um, you know, like I was just like, Twitter was not going to do anything to accommodate me, you know? So I, I really had to figure out, you know, like creative ways to like, you know, like for example, in, in the DM UI, I, I did stuff like, if the latest message is yours, then mark it unread, right? Be, or, or, or sorry, mark it read, because obviously if you sent a message, you saw yeah, it, right? Um, yeah, just, just <laughs> thing, things like that. Um, I don't know, that's one thing that I think I, I was pretty proud of. I, I liked, it was flawed, I liked the search interface. I, I don't think I got that in the, um, I think that was nicely, I think um, in my experience, like, search and filtering type UIs are like one of the hardest things to design well on iOS and w without turning into sort of like the million bells and whistles kind of interface. Um, so that was something I, I was, at least at the time, I was 
proud of how I solved the problem. Although Jack, again, felt that I really buried trends. Like I sort of put trends in this little kind of like thing you tap on. It made conceptual sense to me, but anyway, yeah, so. All right, well, I guess that's, that's it. All right, thanks for listening. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.